Most people that record nowadays are probably familiar with the idea of using a tape deck as an echo or a delay, but most people don't understand that tape decks were the very first effects units ever used in studios. So sounds that we're very familiar with today, like phasing, flanging, chorusing, slapback echo, and delay, were originally byproducts of a studio workflow that's largely fallen by the wayside and been forgotten because frankly, there's a lot easier and cheaper ways to achieve those sounds nowadays. However, there's something really special about that studio workflow, and I'm very excited to announce that it's back because our much loved Deco hardware pedal is now a plugin. So what makes Deco different from all the other tape based plugins on the market, of which there are some really nice sounding ones that do a good job of emulating the way that a tape deck works? Well, for one, it's Strymon, so you know it's going to sound killer. And for two, Deco is actually two tape decks in the same plugin. So it really does represent that long lost studio workflow that I was mentioning before. So in this scenario with two tape decks, all of the effect types that I mentioned, phasing, flanging, chorusing, slapback, echo, and delay, they're all created simply by changing the offset between those two tape decks. So there's a ton of variation that you could do simply by changing that offset. And it's something that you can't do with a single tape deck or a single plugin or two plugins. So I'll cover the controls for the double tracker section, which is the dual tape decks in a second. But on the left hand side of the plugin, you have control over the saturation behavior for those tape decks. So controls here are for saturation amount, tone, volume, and a low trim, which is a simple high pass filter to gently roll off bass frequencies before they hit the saturation. Uh, and there's two operating modes. So the first one is classic. It's the one that most people who are familiar with the Deco hardware are probably the most familiar with. So it accurately emulates the saturation characteristics from a high-end two-track uh, stereo open reel mastering deck. Um, but we also, when we came out with the new version of the hardware last summer, we also added a new cassette mode. And it's not a lo-fi mode, it's, that's not what it means. It actually recreates the ALC auto limiting circuit that was found on some really high-end cassette decks back in the 70s. And it's basically a noise reduction technique, but if you think about the name, auto limiting, there's a dynamic compression element to the sound of it. So along with the tape saturation, you also get this neat compression, which can help you tame transients. When it comes to deco and saturation, it's really important to remember that it was originally designed for guitar players. And as a guitar player, I can tell you that we like gain, lots of it. So all of that research and measurement and study that went into trying to figure out how to recreate the behavior of tape decks goes well into non-reality on purpose because we wanted to be able to use it as a distortion pedal. So much more than you would really be able to get in the real world with a tape deck and a console, or at least longer than the 10 seconds before the head stack caught on fire and all the VU needles bent double. Uh, so at low levels of saturation, Deco is a beautiful sounding mastering tape deck. At higher levels, you can spank your tracks mercilessly without fear of reprisal from your gear. And there's also two modes. There's normal and studio mode in terms of gain staging. Studio modes where you should probably be leaving it most of the time in your DAW. Um, in this video, we're gonna be talking about using it with drums, keyboards, vocals, bass, that kind of stuff. So it makes sense to leave it there. But if you really wanna just beat the bejesus out of your source audio, you can set it down to normal, which recalibrates the gain staging in the plugin to expect more like guitar level signals. Over on the double tracker side, the most important control here is probably the lag control because that determines the offset between the reference and the lag deck. And at lower levels, the signals are so close together that our ears can't really discern them as being separate. So we experience them as modulation phenomena, as phasing or flanging. And as we begin to uh, increase that offset between those two decks, we start hearing it more as chorusing. We can almost start hearing them separately. At some point after chorusing, our ears can understand that these echoes are coming from two separate places and start hearing them as individual signals, thus slapback echo, then echo and delay, and finally all the way to 500 milliseconds of total delay on the knob. The blend control determines the mix between the reference and the lag deck. At minimum, there's no lag deck. At maximum, there's no reference deck. And at noon, it's a 50-50 mix of both. The wobble knob introduces modulation and tape-based artifacts like wow and flutter to the signal. And the type controls determine the way that the audio is output from the tape decks. So there's three modes, sum, invert, and bounce. In sum mode, the output from the reference deck and the output from the lag deck are summed together and sent out. 
In invert mode, the output from the lag deck is phase inverted first before it's summed together. And the effect can be kind of neat. It can actually sound like you're hearing an echo come off a wall back to the microphone in a studio. So it can be used for some neat effects. And then in bounce mode, the right output of the lag deck is bounced over to the left output. And the effect is different depending on where the wide stereo button is. So if wide stereo is on, the effect feels like a double bounce. And if wide stereo is off, it appears more like a ping pong. The auto flange button enables a virtual studio engineer to help you sort of hold faders and hold the flanges so you can get a true through zero tape flange effect. And the knob determines the speed of it going back and forth through zero. And then finally, in the upper right hand corner, you can set the delay repeats in Deco to adhere to the tempo of your song. So it'll listen to the tempo come out of your DAW and you just select the note value based upon those buttons there in the upper right hand corner. And so at this point, we should probably turn around, open up Pro Tools, and I've got a session in there I can show you a bunch of different examples on drums and bass and vocals and all sorts of stuff on how you can use both the saturation side and the double tracker side of Deco to help add width and girth to the parts in your session. Okay, so here we are in Pro Tools. I've got a session here that will help us see some of Deco's capabilities to make things bigger, wider, fatter, deeper that kind of idea. Um, it's a pop tune, starts off with cellos and uh, vocals, then big drums, then big bass. We're going to look at uh, B3 organs, guitars, vocal ooze, all sorts of stuff. So let's check out just the intro to see what we're dealing with here. There may be no way that hero may have found its mark. So um, when I sang this originally, it was over Rhodes, and I really quite liked these plucked uh, cellos. Uh, but the vocal is quite stark, in a good way, actually. Um, but the cellos have some ambience on them. And even though I want the vocals to stick out front and be stark, I'd like there to be something that glues them together, if that makes sense. So I'm going to use Deco with a saturated delay to act as a sort of uh, Velcro layer, if you will, between the vocal and the cellos. I want the vocal to still feel pretty dry, but it, to have something on it that helps tie them together. Now, a word about how I actually have a tendency to route audio in sessions like this. I almost always want one pristine version of each instrument by itself. It might have EQ and compression on it and stuff, but it's sort of a complete sound. And if I want to add something to it, uh, traditionally, I will have an aux return with whatever I'm adding uh, at 100% wet set on phase together. That way I have complete control over the original sound and I have whatever it is that I'm trying to add. And so that's what I'm doing here. I've got Deco sitting on aux return. And at the moment, you can see that the, the plugin is unbypassed, but neither the tape saturation or the double tracker is turned on. So let's just listen to the vocal and add in just the double tracker. There may be no way out of this that hero may have found its mark. Now that's way too much, it's way too much. But it already sounds nice, that is a lovely sound. You can hear that in bounce mode, the cross patching of the lag deck and the reference deck together are creating this lovely complex wash of echoes. It's not just a simple repeat. There's some really neat uh, stuff going on. Now, that's obviously too loud. Uh, but what I'm going to do is just sort of pull this back for a second to where it should be. I've got it sort of automated to where the level should be. Now, we'll listen to this. It's not quite right yet, and I'll show you why. There may be no way out of this. Now, that's quite dry. You can just tell that there's some echo there. But if I add the saturation side in there, now those repeats will be a little bit more distinct because we're saturating the signal before it hits the echo. So all the echoes are saturated as well. And you can tell as well that I'm pulling off a little bit of bass with the low trim control so that the echo repeats don't have much bass in them to get in the way of the rest of the mix. Now, listen to the difference. There may be no way out of this that hero may have found its mark. Saturation off. There's no way that you could miss. On. Even if my face were dark. So you can 
see that what the saturation is doing is it's giving you a bit more presence and a bit more sort of immediacy on the repeats so that when the cello stop plucking, you hear just a little bit of that echo off the left speaker, which is really cool. Now, um, at this point, big loud drums come in and we can get a chance to look at how the saturation sort of side works and investigate just how extremely you can begin to just beat the heck out of something. So let's go there. Let's go to the drums. The drums are here. Now, before we do that, let me just mute that vocal. There we go. Okay, so drums are here. Now the drums already sound pretty good. Uh, as a matter of fact, they sound very good. Um, in in many instances, you might not even want to change anything about them. They sound good. I've been working on them for a while. Uh, but there are two things that I would like to do. So first thing, we should just sort of listen to them. Here's what I'd like to have happen with these drum parts. I would like them to be a little bit more um, sort of in your face. Not much, just a little. I'm talking subtlety here. And I would also like the sort of the notes to be a little longer. I'd like them to last longer. And in order for them to do that, I need to have some sort of dynamic process or compression to have that happen. So I'm going to use the new cassette mode in the saturation side of Deco to accomplish this. So this gives us a chance to sort of listen to um, the range of saturation that's available in both uh, cassette and classic mode. So if I pull up our Deco here, I'm gonna unbypass this guy for a second. I'm gonna mute the reverb. And so by the way, that's big sky there. That's our big guy there just doing a small plate. Wonderful, just on the snare itself. And I'm gonna mute the clean aux return on the drums. So um, this routing scenario is very similar to what I just described on the vocal. I have one clean aux return of just the stereo drums the way I like them. And I have a duplicate of that that I'm gonna add deco to. And now we're gonna listen to just that so we can hear the range of saturation. So we'll start playing some drums here and I'll start with cassette mode uh, and you can start hearing uh, how much uh, it's possible to beat these things up. That might be too much, but it doesn't matter. It's addicting. So if we listen to the classic voice, you can hear that it's a little different. It doesn't have as much compression in it. So it's not gonna sit on those transients as much. It's not gonna actually be as controlled as it was with cassette. Pretty great. Now, remember I talked about the difference between normal and studio mode? We're in studio mode right now. <laughs> Let's go to normal mode. Like I said, if you just want to mangle and decapitate anything, you can totally do it with this. So let's go back to where uh, something that sort of feels a little bit more uh, normal for this. Now, the idea behind this is that I want this duplicate of my drum kit to be pretty crunchy, and I'm just gonna bring it up underneath the normal clean drum kit. So I'm not looking to replace what I already had, I'm just looking to augment it a little bit. And you'll see when we mix these in together, how much of a difference it makes. So we'll turn the reverb back on, We'll turn the clean mold back on and we'll just start listening to the normal drums and start adding in this deco channel. You can see it makes a huge difference and being able to route audio like this means that I don't have to change what I already liked 
I can basically just do it and add something new to it to try out a new texture or a new sort of sound. So uh, I'm going to sort of turn the automation back on to make sure that my mix is about there because I'm listening really quietly in here. I'm not mixing today. I'm talking to you. There's a difference. Um, however, at this point, if you remember that the lead vocal in the intro had a very light sounding delay, now that the drums are in here, that delay is going to get buried by all of this thickness in the drums. So we need to basically turn the blend control on the deco plugin that is on the vocals up a little bit so you can still hear a little bit of those delays at the end. So let's do that. So if we look back at this channel here and we pop down into the deco blend control, you can see that I've got it set to roll up the delay and the, as the drums come in. So let's listen to that. We'll uh, do a little bit of pre-roll here, turn the vocals back on. And now when the drums come in, you'll hear that the uh, actual blend control of the deco, this guy here, will crawl up because it's automated. There's no way that you could miss Even if my face were dark I should have known I'd speak too soon I should have a hair So it totally works. You can see that as a saturator, Deco is an amazing, uh, not just a bloomer and a fattener, but a total mangler if you absolutely want it to be. So let's move on to the bass. So the bass comes in and it has sort of uh, an interesting thing in it. The bass uh, in this situation, you have two elements to it. You have a bass line that I played with my fingers on an electric bass, and then you have a synth that is doing the same part. And the thing about the synth is, it's kind of a saw wave, and as a result, it's it's kind of aggressive. And so the electric bass is having a hard time sort of um, competing, if you will, with that. So if we just listen to the bass. <laughs> the sawtooth bass, which is kind of funny. And then we have the finger bass, which I played. But it feels like the electric bass needs to be more aggressive so that that whole sound feels more like one thing as opposed to just uh, two disparate elements. So what we do, if I remember, or we, here we go, I can add a duplicate of my bass there, there we go. And we can actually begin to beat it up with Deco. So in this instance, I'm not really worried about, um, I don't want it to be clean. I already have one of those. I'm looking again for something that's gonna help me add something to this bass. So if we listen to the bass by itself, we just bring in Deco here. I'm gonna do two things with Deco. I'm gonna actually saturate it. I'm gonna sort of fuzz it up, but I'm also gonna use the double tracker and introduce some uh, low level phase anomalies, flanging, phasing kind of stuff, because that will actually help it mate with the synth bass. So if we start with just this bass by itself, saturate it. Now obviously it sounds comical, but remember, it's about the gestalt, it's about how it sounds in the mix. Now. I'm gonna add the double tracker to this so that we can hear what it sounds like with some sort of pitch modulation and some weirdness in it that might help it mate better with that synth bass. So that's weird, but if we turn on the synth bass and set this level back to where it probably closer to where it should be, all of a sudden we have whole bass sound. With the drums.
without that bass. It's a little less important sounding. It has a little less girth on the bottom and it doesn't quite glue all three of those bass parts together. So doing it this way gives me a lot more control over the entire bass sound. So let's move to some ooh. So in the bridge, um, I, I remember when I was putting the song together, I remember singing some oohs, but it was so long ago, I didn't know where the heck they were, and which hard drive they were on. And it ended up that they were on a hard drive. I had no idea where they were. They were in a different version of the tune, in a different key, in a different tempo. So I had to sort of bring them in so that we could, uh, we could listen to them. But here's what we get if we just listen to the oohs. Now the oohs, are playing over a different set of changes. So we've got these guys, they're very smooth. But they're, um, they're so smooth that they're a little boring. <laughs> they, they need some help. If I turn these, uh, if I turn everybody off, well, you can hear everybody play at once. It needs to be longer. Basically, the ends of those oohs need to hang over the keyboard parts and the drum parts so that you hear them and it makes more sense because then they can sort of be in different places than the mix and it makes sense. So if I, uh, see, is that the right one? Yeah, we go. So if I turn this guy, in this, in this instance, it's actually very simple. It's just a 200 millisecond um, delay, but we're using wide stereo in this instance. So I'm gonna show you the difference. So if I uh, solo these for a second. So here's where it is now. Which is nice. Now here, if I turn wide stereo off, remember it's more of a ping pong. Pretty cool. So if we listen to this in context, now the oohs have a lot more sustain. They, uh, they, they make more sense in the mix. So it's pretty cool. If you need something that uh, gives you some extra sustain, and we're not talking about compression, then uh, some sort of time-based effect works really well for that, and Deco is brilliant. So if we look a little further, so in, I mentioned that I've got a B3 and, uh, and a piano in here. So this is my nine foot grand that I sold uh, years ago that I never should have, like an idiot. Bad decisions uh, are part of anyone's life, especially if you're a musician. Almost like trying out a new hairstylist the day before you film the video. <clears throat> In any case, so I have two B3s here. And the reason I have two B3s is because I recorded the original B3 and somehow the tub microphone got lost. I have no idea where it is. It's gone. I don't know if it's corrupted or something, but you can hear that all you're hearing in this track is just the horns. There's no tub. <laughs> it's gone. So I doubled this part with uh, a, a modeled organ so that it's got some actual low end tub in it. And now they, they work together with sort of four horns. But because this section is so smooth, it makes sense to do something weird with that thin organ. So in this sense, <laughs> Why don't we make it weird? Uh, because at this point, there's no singing going on, there's no lyrics, it's just a bunch of oohs. So what we can do is bring up another deco on another aux return like I've been doing the whole time. And this time, we're gonna play with the wobble. So the B3 is here. You wouldn't want that on the whole time. I promise you, you would not. However, in context, in just this section, it kind of works.
last example, I have guitars in the chorus. Now, uh, one thing to mention about panning, um, it's a very common thing in mixing to have uh, a dry instrument panned to one place in the stereo field and have a 100% wet effect that is correlated to that dry channel pan somewhere else. So in this instance, I have uh, a chorus guitar that is panned hard right, almost, uh, and it's dry. And then I have um, an Echo Boy plug-in that's sort of like uh, panned pretty much left correlated to it. So when you listen to it, you get a stereo spread. Which is nice. Now I have a corresponding part on the other channel with slightly different pitches. And I want to do the same kind of thing only using Deco. So if we pull this up, pull this guy up. Now I've got Deco, a saturated version of it, and I've got it tempo synced to triplets. Um, and I've got it in some mode and it's saturated as well. So let's pull, uh, here we'll pull the other guy out of here and listen to just one at a time. So here's the double tracker by itself for the guitar. It's the coolest, vintage, vibiest sounding bounce. Like it just is, it just sounds perfect. It's instant Sun Studios and Abbey Road, it's wonderful. Now if we saturate those, you get this. So if you hear them together as two guitars playing a similar part, pretty cool. And if you hear them all in context, you get this. start out in the verse. Hopefully this has given you an idea of just how powerful a tool Deco can be for transforming tracks in your sessions. It doesn't matter if you need saturation or girth or width or depth, it can do it all and it does it in a way that is the definition of old school. So if you need any more information, please check us out on Strymon.net, check us out on YouTube and download the plugin and try it. It's free for seven days. So thanks very much for your time and I'll see you again. Cheers.